So I'm here in Boston because my buddy Steve Gradge told me about a, this amazing Red Sox collection. And he tipped me off that the seller might actually be willing to sell a few pieces. Hey, Rick. Hey, how's it going? All right, Pat, welcome. Thanks for coming out here. Oh, thanks. We've got some amazing items here that I want to show you. Okay. This is the most extraordinary and unique collection of Red Sox team signed baseballs that you're going to find anywhere on the planet. Starts from 1901, which would be this ball right here, and all the five World Series they won with Babe Ruth. And this one is the first and earliest Babe Ruth signature that we know of that's out there on a baseball. That's incredible. And we have the world's largest baseball card. <laughs> the world's largest baseball card. Don't put it in the spokes of your bike because this one signed by Cy Young. Okay, pretty damn cool. <laughs> I'm representing the owners of the biggest team baseball collection in Red Sox history. Today, we're going to be able to offer the Cy Young cabinet card. The owners are looking to get $175,000. The other item we have is Ted Williams' 477th home run baseball. They're looking to get $50,000 for that. I mean, this is really neat. These two pieces the owners are willing to part with. This baseball is Ted Williams' 477th home run. Why don't you put that glove on right yeah. there? Yeah, I mean, he's Mr. Baseball in Boston. Oh, he wrote all over it. That's really wrote cool. all over it. Home run number 477, June 24th, 1958. Yeah, I think Ted Williams was basically considered a god in this town. Oh, <laughs> still is. He was yeah. the Red Sox Mickey Mantle. And we're talking about a World War II veteran here. He missed five years of his career to go to the military and serve our country and still hit 521 home runs. This is an excellent piece. What this is is a cabinet card from 1893 signed by Cy Young. As far as we know, there's only six of these out there in the world. The best part about it is if you look over here, this actually comes in the envelope that he sent it with his handwriting. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's Cy Young, who's arguably the greatest baseball player ever to live. Yeah. He's a pitcher that won over 500 games. 511. It would be mathematically impossible for any pitcher to do that nowadays, because they just, they don't play that many games. So, super cool collection. So, gloves off, what is the price of the Ted Williams ball? Our team will accept 50000 for that ball. Okay. And the world's largest baseball card. We're asking 175000 for that. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit pricey. <laughs> so I'm going to go give uh, Steve a call. Just, okay. You know, I just want a little input here. Give me a few minutes. I'll be right back. I'm going to go give him a call. Okay, great. So I guess you already know about this stuff. Yeah, it's some really great stuff. This is some of the best stuff I've ever seen outside of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So I really love number 477, Ted Williams. I think it's really, really cool. He's certainly still the most famous Red Sox player almost of all time. So I see we have the letter as well. This is from Steve Runnels. Pete Runnels was a pretty good ball player in his own right and a former teammate of Ted's. So it says, my father Pete Runnels and Ted Williams were teammates. On June 29th, 1958, Ted Williams hit his 477th career home run. The ball was hit atop the roof in right field. Now, that's a great story. My father acquired the baseball and he wrote the score and information about the home run on the ball and then had Ted Williams autograph the ball. Now, I'm, you know, semi-familiar with this. You're not really going to see much on here. It's just mostly a faded signature but, you know, the thing you want is that and that, um, which is absolutely phenomenal. And then we have this Cy Young baseball card. This is a really fantastic piece of history. Cy Young, obviously, you know, really the greatest pitcher of all time. Two years after he died, they named the Cy Young Award after him. But the great thing about this, and I know the history about this piece, is this letter is tied in directly to this. So this is Cy Young sending this to someone. And I don't know if you could ask for better provenance. So, what do you think they're worth? You have two great pieces here, Rick. These are museum quality. So the first one, obviously Cy Young, just focusing on this, how incredibly rare it is. I could easily see this going for $200,000. Okay, and the ball? So the baseball is really interesting, you know, and I love the letter, it ties it all in together. I'd put that value right at 65,000. Okay. You want to have dinner later? If you're buying. Well, if I buy anything, I'm going to be broke, so you'll have to buy. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Good luck. Okay. All right. So the ball and the Cy Young, I will give you 175 grand. 
For all of it. For these two, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. Just, I absolutely cannot do that. Our price is two and a quarter right now. And your best price is? My best offer? I'll give it all to you for 220. <sighs> My best offer is literally gonna be 180. I'm sorry, just can't do it that low. Okay, well, if you change your mind, let me know. Okay, but thanks a lot. I was disappointed that we couldn't come to an agreement on price, but we're gonna hold on to them. We know there's other interested buyers out there and we know we'll get our price eventually. So I'm down in Florida looking for a vintage sport boat for a client of mine, and I think I found one. Is this the boat? Yep, Sam 5. And I might be kicking myself here later because for some reason I brought Chum along. Hey, Skipper. <laughs> it's Rick Harrison. We talked on the phone? We did. Bob Melton. This Chum is Chum. Hi, Chum Lee. How are you? Welcome Good. to South Florida. So this is it? This is it. This is Sam 5. It's a 1964 Rybovich. By the mid-60s, this was the quintessential custom sports fisherman. OK. Me and Rick are on vacation, so this is the perfect way to kick it off. We're working. This is not a vacation. Uh, oh. <laughs> this boat is a 37-foot sports fisherman maintained to what I like to call Palm Beach condition, borderline perfection. My wife and I get a little older. We'd like to optimize and get a boat that would be a little more comfortable for cruising in our golden years, as they say. I'm impressed. It's amazing. Hop Rybovich was a Polish immigrant. He was a craftsman from the old country. He had three sons that all went off to World War II, and they came back and developed the Rybovich name. Most of the major elements that are seen on modern sports fishermen today were developed by the Rybovichs. That's the fighting chair. Fighting chair. This chair was designed specifically to support catching fish up to 1,000 pounds. And Rybovich invented that, right? They did. Okay. It bolted down through the hull so that it won't get ripped out, and it's also quite comfortable. I'm going to try this uh, couch out. Yeah. This chart table is a specialty that Rybovich developed, so you can okay. figure out where you're going. The boat is fully air conditioned. It's got a full head or bathroom with a shower and a full galley or kitchen. Oh, I like that. And then two bunks. You could live on this. We do. My wife and I cruise this for months at a time. This is beautiful. I'm ready to hit the water. Are we going to test drive this thing or what? <laughs> <laughs> Everything about this boat is absolutely amazing. Please tell me you're not letting him drive. <laughs> Not only were they sport fishing boats, but it was literally luxury of the day. And even today, you just don't see work like this anymore, period. Want to see how fast this boat goes? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the original boats that he did that was designed like this. It's wooden hull. It's all mahogany inside. It's teak deck. It's got new engines in it. Everything's been redone. It's exactly what I'm looking for. You've done a beautiful job maintaining this boat. Now we'll just see if I can come up with the right price on it. So what did you think, Chum? I thought it was pretty awesome, but I guess we do got to get to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, what's your best price on it? Well, I'm listing at 379. Um, we go 340. I, I really can't. It's an amazing boat. We take 350. I, I can't do 350. I'll meet you in the middle. That'd be about 364, 365. No, I'd do like 350. I literally have $350,000 in upgrades of this boat in the last two years. <sighs> well, thanks anyway, man. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. You did an amazing job with this thing. You really did. I'm really close on this boat, but I have a customer that's willing to pay a certain amount. And by the time I get this thing back to the West Coast, there's no money to be made. Have a good one. You know See what ya. boat means, right? Bust out another thousand. <laughs> I'm here at the National in Chicago, which is a huge collector's convention that's jam-packed with cool stuff from all over the country. I'm actually here doing a celebrity appearance, but I'm also here to buy stuff. So hopefully, it's going to be a great day. 
Hey, how's it going? All right, how are you doing? Pretty good. What do we got here? I have a Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player in the history of space and time, game used jersey. A game used jersey yeah. for Michael Jordan. And autographed across the front with a certificate of authenticity from the Chicago Bulls. That's pretty amazing. I have a game used jersey signed by Michael Jordan. I've been buying and selling autographs and memorabilia my entire life. I got this jersey many years ago at one of the Chicago Bulls charity auctions. I'm asking $150,000. This is very cool. And I guess you want to sell this thing? If the price is right, it'll leave my possession. It's a really unique thing. 1996-97 season, which is identified by the gold NBA logo on the front of the jersey. They only wore that in the NBA's 50th anniversary season. If you look at the back of the jersey, the way the name and number is set up, the jerseys they sold in the store, the numbers were further down. The way the Bulls did them, it was really unique how they're higher up, so there was a difference between everything else. Michael Jordan, he was the first mega sports star to basically become a billionaire. Yes, I, I, his salary actually was never that much for the NBA, but his work with Nike, Champion, uh, Wilson Sporting Goods. His mega fortune is from the shoes. Yes. I mean, he got the most lucrative shoe deal ever. Okay, um, how much you want for this thing? I'm asking $150,000. $150,000. Okay. Um, I'm going to go get Steve. He's the autograph guy. Maybe we could do something. Okay. Give me a few minutes. We could talk shop. Steve Grad's going to look at this jersey and know the autograph is fine. It came right from the Chicago Bulls. There isn't anywhere better to get a Michael Jordan's autograph except having Michael Jordan himself sign it for you. Steve, look at this. Cool. What's up, buddy? How you Good doing? Good to see Steve. you. Nice to see you. Greatest basketball player of all time. You know, obviously being from Chicago, I'm watching him grow up, and I was getting Michael Jordan's autograph when he was very young, all throughout his NBA career. There's really nobody at least better in my book. So he's got this paperwork right here from the Chicago Bulls. Okay. Looks like nice paperwork. I'm pretty familiar with this stuff. So the one thing about Jordan, though, and you're gonna have your concerns, obviously, is heavily forged, heavily duplicated. Let's flip this around. I wanna take a look at it. Obviously, it was something like this, it's going to be a fiber tip marker that's going to go on here. So I just want to look at it and just get a better feel for it. And as I move along, the autograph is kind of seeped in here. And this is what you would expect with age, would kind of bleed into the fabric. So that's kind of a good point here. Now, the great characteristic about Jordan is that M. That's Michael, OK? And this is what I like to see as a slight tilt to it, but the flow. And he flows through. And we see this again with the J. The J comes through. And Jordan had this beautiful, flowing signature. So, it's a legit signature. No doubt about it. I mean, I, I love the autograph. It sits perfectly on this okay. jersey. So the big question, you got the paperwork right there. Do you think it's real? What do you think it's worth? But there's really only one Jordan. The stuff, Rick, is just hot. And it's hot everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's in Chicago, overseas, Puerto Rico. There's no one more popular, I still think, in the game of basketball than Jordan. So we've seen some crazy auction prices, but I would put this right at about $135,000. Okay. It's a little shock, but that's what you get with the greatest player in NBA history. <laughs> good luck. Thanks, man. Yep. Good to see you. Thank you. Yep. Good luck. All right. I'll give you 90 grand. Okay. I'm no way I'm going to be able to take that low for this jersey. So what would you take? I mean, I'm asking 150. I mean, if you're in the ballpark, I'd consider it, but I'm not going to be able to do anything near that low. I mean, I'd go 100. I mean, I got to make money off the thing. I, I, I understand. I, I would do 125, but I don't have a dime or less than that I'd be able to take. If you change your mind, call me. I, I will. I do appreciate your time. Okay. It's super cool, but in the long run, the math doesn't make sense for me anymore. Yeah, okay? I, I understand. All right. Have a good one, man. Thank you, sir. I'm going to take the jersey and put it back in the safe at home now. One day I'll get a price that makes me happy. Chum and I are in Southern California at an automotive museum. Now, none of the cars in the museum are actually for sale, but John Marconi, who's like one of the most famous auto builders in the world, actually has one of his personal vehicles he's looking to sell. A 1971 Plymouth Barracuda. So where's the Cuda? Through that door. The 1971 Plymouth Cuda was at the pinnacle of muscle cars. When you think of a muscle car, you think of a Cuda. So I'm going fishing, and hopefully I get lucky. Come on in, guys. You recognize this? Um, is that Knight Rider? D1. That's pretty amazing. What's a Knight Rider? This is Kit. 1982 Knight Rider, David Hasselhoff. The car would talk to you. 
Oh, I remember Knight Rider. I'm sorry, I was born in 82. It was a little before my time. And oh my god, look at that. Is that what I think it is? It is what you think it is. The original. Michael Keaton, 1992, Batman Returns. What kind of gas mileage does this thing get? I don't know. It's got JP5. It burns out the rear end, and that's where you get f six, eight feet of flame, so a lot. Sounds like Rick after lunch. <laughs> this thing is awesome. Yeah, yeah, Chubb, it's cool, but this is what we came to see. It's a 1971 Kuna. I mean, this is like the pinnacle of the muscle car. It is the Zenith, and Chrysler was leading the game at the time. I'm looking at selling my wife's 1971 340 Cuda. The car is fully equipped. It's got chin spoilers, a go wing, and a nice, healthy 340 motor. The car is just absolutely immaculate. I'm looking to get $90,000 for my wife's 71 Cuda. It was built for speed, you know what I mean? It didn't handle corners or anything like that, but from stoplight to stoplight, you were going to beat your friends. It's got the original motor and transmission, power brakes, power steering. I want it safe for my wife to drive. We'd get groceries in it. I mean, this was her daily driver. This is definitely the pinnacle of grocery getters. hundred <laughs> percent. I have to agree with you there. Can we see underneath the Absolutely. Time? Wow. This is the beautiful thing about cars back then. There was room to work underneath the hood. And when you open the hood, you knew what the motor was, because there we go right there, 344 barrel. This thing will pass anything but a gas station. Probably <laughs> gets much. like eight, nine miles a gallon. Pretty much. If you were going driving to California, you have to stop like every 100 miles to fill it up. Yeah, fuel was 96 cents back then. I'm super impressed. That is a beautiful engine. So how much are you looking for? Ready? Ready. 90. 90 dollars? <laughs> what a guy. 90,000. Can we take it for a spin? Keys are in it. Should I drive? All right, this is why we came here. <laughs> I'll sit in the passenger seat. Keep it under 100, Rick. Ooh. Knock yourself out. Sounds good. It does sound really good. It drives good. It doesn't feel like super jerky sometimes when you get in a muscle car and you know you hit on the gas and it's like that's what it's supposed to do. So what do you think about the car, Rick? So far I love it. So what are you thinking about offering it? I think I'll offer him 60000 for it. I think that's a fair price. This just screams 1971. I wouldn't know. I wasn't born for 11 years. But I imagine in the year you had hair was a good one. <laughs> There's a little problem. He wouldn't go over 40. <laughs> so he drove it like an old man? He is an old man. It was a badass <laughs> ride, though. It was pretty amazing. How much did you want for this thing? 90. You sure it wasn't 60? If I come back with 60, my wife will have my head. It's her car. Because I'd really love to give you 60,000 for it. 80,000 is pretty much it. I can't, I can't go much lower than that. They're going for like 85, 90 at an auction. But once you take the auction fees out and all the brain damage there, that's why I'm thinking 65. <sighs> Rick, I can't swing it. I can't do that. Will you do 70? Man, I can't swing it. This just, I, I, I can't get that deep. Okay. Like I said, my wife would have my head. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to drive back to Vegas, go home, talk to the wife, and let me know if you change your mind. You got it. All right, Chubb. Uh, let's go back to Vegas.